The Academy's principal aim is to develop the qualities of leadership, character, and intellect demanded of an army officer on first appointment. A great deal will be expected of you. I didn't join the forces to be mollycoddled or treated any different. He, he, made a, he made a space for himself very quickly as a member of a highly professional team and he earned the respect of everybody around him. Every day you come in to work and you don't quite know what's going to happen. It's quite exciting in that sense. It's unpredictable. He's a hard-working member of the team, always keen to get his hands dirty and help out. William said to a friend recently that, that his priorities were family and flying in that order. I think nothing ever prepares you that well for what you're going to see and some of the some of the incidences. You must be courageous, yet selfless. Leaders, yet carers. Confident, yet considerate. He'll be treated the same as anybody else. He'll wear the same uniform. Um, well, I'm still here to tell the tale, and I haven't been built for a plane, so so far it looks all right. He's a terrific pilot. He's a great guy to have around. Doing a job like this is worthwhile, valuable, um, and to me, there's an element of duty about it. And you must be all these things in some of the most challenging environments around the world. And my prayers for your success and safety will follow you wherever you may be called upon to serve. Prince William, of course, has had stints with all of the services, primarily with the Army, but seconded both to the Navy and to the Royal Air Force. Hello. I just want to say thank you for rescuing me last year. Was it, was it you? Yeah. Was it from the beach in Alvaro Slanger? Was it? Um, yeah. Some of my earliest memories relate to times that my parents spoke to me, um, or even better, showed me what it meant to have both privilege and responsibilities. The royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol, but actually in William and Kate, you see a future king and queen who are driving it forward and taking it on to the next step. The boy who would be king. Born into the most famous family in the world, destined for a life of duty, following in the footsteps of his grandmother, his father, and a long line of British monarchs before them. This family has service sort of, you know, running through them. William has got it, his father's got it, his grandmother's got it. But I think he's also very much, much more a man of the modern age and of the people. It's clear for Prince William, royalty is not just a privilege, but a duty. Well, Diana fell pregnant with, with William very quickly, and uh, by 82, the country had, um, had a new heir, and uh, that was a cause for great celebration. The crowds, the photographers, the world's press were all camped outside the Lindo Wing at St Mary's. Crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace throughout the evening. Then at 10.25, their patience was rewarded with the formal notice of the birth. It was signed by Mr. George Pinker, the Queen's gynaecologist, and other doctors who attended the princess. The crowd cheered to the echo. The fact that Diana produced a little boy, an heir, um, I think just further endeared her to the British public. People loved her even more, and when she came out holding Prince William with Prince Charles, images that really just melted, I think, even the most hardened hearts around the country. And uh, it, was, it was a cause for great celebration. Um, Britain had come through a difficult time, and I think the royal family were giving the country something to look forward to. The skies were clear this morning as the Royal Australian Air Force jet made its approach. Prince and Princess emerged showing no sign of a long flight and obviously well educated in the right sort of clothes to wear in Central Australia. And then the moment more than a hundred reporters and cameramen flew from all over the world to see the public debut of nine-month-old Prince William, second in line to the throne. Of course, for Prince William, he will have been able to understand little of what was going on around him at the time as his nanny carried him down the steps of the aircraft to Australian soil. Diana's decision to take the baby Prince William with her on their tour of Australia and New Zealand was criticised in some corners of the media, but it was a turning point for Diana and the catalyst for her to grow in popularity with the public. Exactly on time, the family emerged from the house, one prince carrying another. Son of Prince Charles and Diana, Princess of Wales, 
Prince William was set to start his royal career from a very early age, being schooled in that sense of duty. The princess, wisely hedging her bets a little, had told us she would not guarantee that the 10-month-old prince would crawl. So what did Prince William do immediately? William had a, a fairly traditional aristocratic childhood in as much as he was taken care of by nannies. His parents were, were, you know, Diana particularly was a modern parent, but she was a modern aristocratic parent and she did use nannies and the nannies really were the people that William spent most of his time with. He had been a very outgoing little boy. He, at his first school, he was known as Basher, Basher Wills or Basher Wales, because um, he was, you know, quite stroppy and confident. After his early years at Ludgrove School, the young Prince William entered the gates of Eton College, where he fitted in easily to its centuries-old traditions. For their eldest son's big day, the Princess of Wales was in the driving seat. With the Prince of Wales at her side, Eton's most famous new boy was with his younger brother Harry in the back. William's education was at Eton College. Eton College is probably the leading public school in England, and it's very traditional. Uh, William's mother, Diana Princess of Wales, insisted that he went to Eton, as did her father and her younger brother Charles. Prince Charles acceded to this. Uh, he went to Gordonston, where he was thoroughly miserable and cried almost every time he had to go back to, to school, even as a teenager. And he allowed his sons both to go to a very elitist school. It's very elite, it's very expensive, it's very posh, if you will, but it also has a degree of freedom for the, for the pupils. They are encouraged to be self-confident and to find themselves. And when William came there after being at Ludgrove, the prep school, people realized as he had to sign in, every pupil signs into the, um, the book when they come, that he was left-handed. First time people realized it, he was a Southpaw. And he was there and he did very well. Neither he nor his brother could say that they were great academic shapes. They weren't. Eton was right for, for William. He enjoyed the sports. He enjoyed swimming, water polo. He loved playing football, soccer. William's time at Eton was, on the whole, unremarkable, and he was left to get on and to develop as a young man. But his time at Eton was, of course, blighted by the tragic death of his mother. You know, how does any... 15-year-old and 12-year-old cope with that. Um, uh, it was devastating for them, obviously. On the day of the funeral, William and Harry walked behind the cortege. Um, it was a long walk and the there were crowds sobbing and and wailing and um, hundreds, thousands and thousands of people lining the route. Uh, and they walked with their father, uh, their grandfather and Charles Spencer. Thank you so much. Thank you. After graduating from Eton, like many young men of his generation, Prince William decided on a gap year. Now he's off to the plains of Patagonia for a 10-week expedition. I wanted to do something constructive um, in my gap year rather than, um, I mean, uh, I could do quite a lot of work, but I thought this was a, a bit more of a way of um, making, uh, trying to help people out and uh, meet a whole range of other different people from um, different countries and at the same time uh, helping people um, in remote areas of Chile. Just a shift in style for the monarchy. 
I think we're very much seeing a royal for the new century. Very relaxed, not stage managed, um, happy to josh a bit uh, with his father in an informal way, but not scared to say exactly what he's feeling and uh, certainly not prepared to dodge the difficult issues. The clearest example of that, his challenge to the press today to let his mother rest in peace. Through his early voluntary work with Rally International, the young prince set off for Chile, where he spent three months working on various community projects. There was no question in any of the gap here, actually, that he was a prince and treated differently. He mucked in, he slept in sleeping bags, you know, he, he cooked food around a campfire. He did everything that everyone else did. A few weeks later, a young Kate Middleton also undertook a similar voluntary role, and on that occasion, they just missed each other. Prince William loves Scotland, and it didn't take him long to decide to continue his education at the University of St Andrews. He did well enough to get not a place at Oxbridge, which could have been fixed for him. There was speculation that he would go to Trinity College, Cambridge, as his father did. But he was sufficient of his own man to say, no, I want to go to Scotland, I like Scotland. He chose St Andrews University, a very ancient university in the Kingdom of Fife. And so, by chance, did Kate Middleton. And that, of course, where they were both first-year students, freshers, that's where they met. It was at St Andrews where that friendship, because it was initially a friendship, flourished. Um, William and Kate were at the same halls of residence at St Salvador's. They were on the same course in the same year. I mean, some people say, wasn't that just too much of a coincidence? Um, but it was how things worked out. And they spent the first year as undergraduates really getting to know each other. The people of St Andrews are a very close-knit sort of society, and they welcomed William with open arms and they were very protective of him and as a result you know he he spent life he spent four years there as a pretty normal student. I think the wonderful thing about St Andrews was it was a bubble away from reality it was it was a life that Prince William had never been able to enjoy whether it was going to the local shops going to a local bar going for his morning swim he could get on with his life and his relationship in private. At all times, they were highly discreet. They were almost never seen together. They were, even with their friends, they didn't allow any gossip to start. The people speculated, but there was nothing uh, definite which proved that they were an item. And I think the pair of them absolutely loved those years. They look upon those St Andrews years with, with great fondness, and uh, they are patrons of St Andrews University because they feel such a strong connection to that place. In his own words, it is time now for the big wide world. But today, William's family, like any other, well, almost, came to say a proud farewell to a place that has allowed him a more normal life than any royal in history. That he is deeply grateful is not in doubt. And partly, of course, it's been about this woman. They've been allowed to develop a relationship without front page scrutiny, and it's helped. Catherine Middleton. Romance did not stand in the way of hard work, and Prince William graduated alongside Kate with a Scottish Master of Arts degree with upper second class honours. Of course, no graduation would be complete without family to proudly celebrate academic achievement, but there are not many who can include the Queen in a university graduation. William Wales. The British royal family have served the armed forces for generations and the Queen, as sovereign, is head of the armed forces and so maintains a very close interest in them. It's a useful place, really, for them to be because, certainly in modern times, because they are away from the prying eyes of the, of the public and the press, the media. It's a useful service. You know, they, um, they get to uh, they get to experience danger and they get to be part of a team and it's great for leadership and for mixing with people from all walks of life, which is something that when they're growing up, historically, they didn't really do so much. 
The reason it's important for members of the royal family to serve in the military is because one day as um, Prince of Wales and then head uh, the Queen or the monarch, um, you are head of the armed services as well as as being head of state, you are head of the military. So it's felt that it's extremely important that if you are going to be head of the military, that in some way you would have served. The Queen, in fact, did serve um, with, uh, during World War II um, with the Women's Corps. Elizabeth is in the ATS, or British WAC, and at the King's request, is being treated just like any other trainee. Queen Elizabeth was the first female member of the royal family to serve in a full-time military role. She diagnosed and repaired faulty engines, and to this day, the Queen is still to be seen at the wheel on her private estates. William's grandfather, Prince Philip, served with distinction in World War II and was awarded the Greek War Cross of Valour. Rising through the ranks, the young Prince Philip became one of the youngest officers in the Royal Navy to be promoted to First Lieutenant. Prince William's father served in the Royal Air Force and the Royal Navy. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. Qualifying as a helicopter pilot in 1974, and joining the 845 Naval Air Squadron operating from the commando carrier HMS Hermes. In February 1976, Prince Charles was promoted to command and he took control of HMS Bronnington, a coastal mine hunter, for his last nine months in the Royal Navy. If later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the, the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Both William and Harry were keen to follow the example of their family and take an active role in the military. After passing the selection process to become an army officer, Prince William took his place at Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy, from which thousands of successful army careers have been launched. Sandhurst used to be filled, I think, with rather dim-witted sons of the aristocracy. Um, today, it is really a, a, you know, a very serious academy. It's a very tough course and hugely physical. You, you pass quite serious exams, academic exams, to get into Sandhurst. And, and then once you're there, the regime is, is pretty um, remorseless. William got through it. William clearly learnt how to march in step here at Sandhurst. By all accounts, he was a natural soldier, considered to be amongst the best in his year. The 44-week training course is gruelling and it's reported that William found enormous strength during this period and made friends who remain close and loyal to this day. Next year sees the 60th anniversary of the formation of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, the spiritual home of the officer corps of the British Army. And the high standards which it continues to demand of its cadets have been exemplified by your impressive drill and turn out today. The Academy's principal aim is to develop the qualities of leadership, character, and intellect demanded of an army officer on first appointment. I place that trust in you with confidence. And my prayers for your success and safety will follow you wherever you may be called upon to serve. Graduating with the rank of Lieutenant Wales, William followed his younger brother into the Blues and Royals as a troop commander, which meant a further five months training at Bovington Camp in Dorset. Harry had been to Sandhurst ahead of William because he didn't, do, uh, he didn't go to university. Um, and he had joined the Blues and Royals regiment. Um, William, when he, when he graduated from Sandhurst, when he passed out, he 
also joined the Blues and Royals. But because of the way that um, the regiments uh, rotated in their deployments, it was quite clear that William was not actually going to make it to Afghanistan. His regiment wouldn't go there um, for 18 months. And rather than sit around um, kicking his heels, doing training work in, in this country, he decided to go and look at the other forces. Prince William moved to the Royal Air Force at RAF College Cranwell. Prince William will arrive here January 2008 and he'll be attached to the Royal Air Force for four months and during that time there'll be some fine training and he'll also then go on to operational squadrons to see how the operational side of the Royal Air Force operates. I think everybody's very excited. I know Prince William's keen to come here and learn to fly and uh, the instructors who've been chosen to teach him are looking forward to it as well. This is the Grob Tutor, it's the RAF's elementary fine training aircraft. All our pilots come into this at the first stage of their training, as soon as they finish officer training. Uh, so the course mates for Flying Officer Wales will be doing exactly the same training as him at this stage. Um, it's fairly docile to fly, it's something you could find similar to at a flying club, but it's also fully aerobatic, so it's quite a capable aircraft and we can up the pace quite quickly, which is what we do on our training course. This is uh, a Takano uh, T Mark I trainer. It's the basic fast jet trainer for the Royal Air Force and Prince William is going to be uh, coming to us from his tutor flying to expand his flying skills, uh, give him some more complicated and advanced techniques uh, and then progress him onto the squirrel phase of his course prior to the award of wings. It's going to be a very exciting uh, period, it's a privilege to train Prince William. Uh, with regard to how he'll be treated, he's going to be treated the same as all the rest of our students and, and all the uh, junior officers that we work with. And the Air Force is known as the Squirrel, and ours is specifically the AS350BB, which is unique to the Air Force only in pure terms of what the aircraft has on, to, has on it in terms of equipment. Uh, we use it for basic military training for all Army, Navy and Air Force rotary students in the UK. So the Prince will fly both the Tutor and the Takano before coming to Shawbury to fly the Squirrel. It's a, it's a huge honour for, for all involved and uh, we, we have uh, had royal visitors in the past and Cranwell especially um, with its association with uh, Prince Charles and his flying training, everyone is very much, very much looking forward to it. He's not just another recruit, but we are trying to make him uh, as, fit in as much as he can. And certainly that's what happened with the army. Um, so he'll be treated the same as anybody else. He'll wear the same uniform. Uh, and those associated with him would call him as they would any other junior officer in the same rank. How's life in the RAF? Very good. Enjoying it very much. Is it um, very different from the army? Um, in certain ways, yeah. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's still the same sort of, um, sort of camaraderie and everyone getting along really well. Now, I understand you flew your first solo flight yesterday. I did, yeah. How did it go? Um, well, I'm still here to tell a tale, and I haven't been built for a plane, so, so far it looks all right. But um, it was one of those experiences whereby I thought it'll never come round. And I thought, you know, hopefully a bit longer yet, I'll get back with practice. And the next thing I know, my instructor jumps out and goes, go on, get on with it. And I was left there sort of looking around the room and going, uh, what? So uh, I just did it, and once you get up in the air, it was fine. It wasn't so bad. His father had loved flying. His grandfather had loved flying. Um, it was very much in the blood, I think. And he, and his brother, of course, Harry, loved flying. So the two brothers became helicopter pilots in the end. Prince William completed a 12-week intensive flying training course at RAF College Cranwell. So he was presenting William with his wings. I mean, it must, he must have felt hugely proud, but also um, a, a sort of bittersweet moment for Charles because he himself wasn't able to carry on with his flying career because it was thought too dangerous for the heir to the throne. Flying officer William Wales, graduating with number 227 and number 97 horses. With Prince Charles pinning on William's wings on his successful completion of the flying course. After serving in both the Army and the Royal Air Force, William was then seconded to train with the Navy, spending three weeks at the Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. So having learnt to, to fly an aeroplane, um, he then went to, do, to explore the Navy, to get a taste of the Navy. And he went out to the Caribbean 
um, on a, a drug policing um, vessel. And during his time there, um, he did, he was part of a crew that busted a huge, huge drugs haul worth millions of pounds. Um, so he, he experienced quite a lot of excitement um, and probably quite a lot of danger, actually. William extended his Royal Naval Short Service Commission for as long as possible, and it's reported that he greatly enjoyed his time in the senior service. But he was called back to the Royal Air Force and promoted to flight lieutenant, taking up training to become a helicopter pilot in the RAF Search and Rescue Service. He was not going into a, a, a battlefield. Nobody knew who he was up in, an, in a helicopter, and yet it was very real and meaningful work. To me, I didn't join the forces to be, like I said, a lot of times before, molly cuddled or treated any different. And as far as I'm concerned, in my eyes, if Harry can do it, then I can do it. Uh, I don't really separate us in that much difference. And I think as a future head of the armed forces, it's really important that I was, get, you get, at least get the opportunity uh, to be credible and to do the job that I signed up for uh, and to do the best I can. I and mean, that's all I ever wanted to do. And the search and rescue role is now, you know, slightly different so obviously being able to go to Afghanistan but it's still doing an important job and I hope that it's yeah I hope it's just step in the right direction exactly for future. The training is demanding and includes advanced handling, night flying, emergency handling and tactical and formation flying on the Griffin H21 helicopter. William Wales. Flight Lieutenant William Wales is posted to the Operation Conversion Unit 203 Squadron Royal Air Force Valley to fly the Sea King. Flight Lieutenant Wales graduated in January 2010 from the Defence Helicopter Flying School at RAF Shawbury. Prince William then transferred to RAF Valley at Anglesey, becoming the first member of the royal family since Henry VII to live in Wales. For the next eight months, he trained on the Sea King helicopter and was assigned to Sea Flight Number 22 Squadron as a co-pilot. Well, before I started Search and Rescue, I had a little brief uh, introduction to it, and it was immediate to me. Um, I spent three hours flying with the guys, and it was totally apparent to me straight away how important the job is, and the skills the guys employ, um, the flying aspects, the, the general airmanship you need to, to have around you, and all the wits you need to survive the weather and whatever sort of situation you're thrown into. Um, it definitely is advanced flying and it's rewarding, so it put the two together and it's a fantastic job. It's rewarding because every day you come in to work and you don't quite know what's going to happen. It's quite exciting in that sense, it's unpredictable. But at the same time, it's great that you get to go out and actually save someone's life, hopefully, or at least make a difference to someone, you know, when you know that they're in trouble. You do everything you can to try and get there and the guys demonstrate that every single day they go out and with the team environment there is in the cockpit. Um, it's very much sort of big family in the sky and, and the guys do a fantastic job. We've got 11 pilots here, William's a fairly new co-pilot but as such he, he, he flies the aircraft as much as anyone else and he'll be called on, upon quite regularly during jobs to take control of the aircraft uh, while the captain's doing something else. Um, uh, regarding the hierarchy we're all pretty much uh, we're all e of equal rank um, just with different varying levels of experience so um, we all get on very very well together, have a joke and a laugh when we're we're on the ground and, and get serious when we're flying. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, when William first arrived on the squadron, it was a massive shock to all of us, fairly dumbfounded, really, uh, that somebody with such a prestige was coming onto our squadron. But very quickly settled into just one of the guys, uh, one of us, one, part of the family, certainly. Um, and day to day, you, you don't even really notice. I suppose in 10, 15 years' time, when we look back on this occasion, it'll seem very, very special and memorable. Um, but he's, he's a great guy to work with. When you're flying along at night in Snowdonia and the mountains and you've got 40 knot winds, the clouds down to about 200 feet and you're trying to get through to find someone who's either broken a leg or is lost on the hill, um, it gets quite interesting. You have to use all four of you, put your brain power together and your skill and basically hope that you, know, you can actually get there and help. There was a, a key moment in his life. It was in 2011, there had been a huge devastating earthquake in New Zealand. And William said to his private secretary, is anyone from the royal family going down to New Zealand? Because if they're not, I would like to go and, and you know, represent the Queen and, and express our 
sorrow at what's happened. And his parents say, you can't possibly do this. You know, you haven't got time. How are you going to work out? You know, you've got this, these number of shifts you've got to do with, the, with search and rescue. He said, it's all right, I've sorted all of that. Just find out whether, whether I can go, whether anyone else is going. So he did, and he went. And he stood side by side with people who'd lost loved ones, homes, businesses. You know, the, the scenes there were absolutely devastating. My grandmother once said that grief is the price we pay for love. Here today, we love and we grieve. And that was the point at which I think William went from being a young man to a future king. Family life beckoned, and during his time at Aria Valley, it was announced that Prince William and Kate Middleton were to marry. The nation took Kate to their hearts, and she has been by his side ever since. On the 29th of April 2011, Prince William and Kate Middleton married in Westminster Abbey. This was very much a, a, a wedding, their personal wedding. Okay, it was very, very public. Obviously, it was televised and, and the world was watching, but it was essentially um, their private wedding, and that's how they kind of treated it. Um, and it, it was very touching, and, and uh, Kate looked absolutely stunning. It was a cause for big celebration. Crowds gathered from far away to take part in the day. After all, Kate would one day become Queen Consort. Like many young newlyweds in the service, duty called and Flight Lieutenant Wales was deployed to the Falkland Islands, becoming part of a four-man crew providing cover for aviation assets and assisting those in need of rescue. Search and rescue pilots here provide 24-hour coverage um, with a Seeking helicopter. They're on duty for a 24-hour period um, and covering any eventuality. Um, as you've seen, the, the distances here are quite large. The roads are not fantastic. And if we need to get somebody, military or civilian, to hospital, um, quite often search and rescue helicopters are the best way of doing it. The deployment was seen as particularly controversial as it came close to the 30th anniversary of the start of the Falklands War. The Argentinians felt that this was a slap in the face to them for Prince William to be marching about in uniform, humiliating the Argentinians on what they still believe is their territory. Balancing home and family life with a career can be difficult. Kate gave birth to their first child, Prince George, in July 2013. The media camped out in excitement to catch a glimpse of the future king. Kate and William greeted the press and introduced Prince George to the world. After this, Flight Lieutenant William Wales took the decision to retire from active service in the Royal Air Force in September 2013. William, I think, that time, those years, as a search and rescue pilot, he really felt that he did achieve something. It was a real job. There were no concessions for who he was. He wasn't wrapped up in cotton wool. Um, but the time came where, he, where the tour of duty came to an end, and I think he left probably with quite a heavy heart. But he'd had a very, very good time there. Um, and I think, you know, he'd, he'd absolutely achieved what he set out to achieve. During his time at RAF Valley, Prince William undertook 156 search and rescue missions, where 149 people were rescued. Whilst in the Royal Air Force, he completed over 1,300 flying hours. It's not often he gets to meet the people whose lives he saved. Sharon West got the opportunity to meet the Prince and to personally thank him for saving her life. Hello. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for rescuing me you know last year. Was it, was it you? Yeah. Was it from the beach in Arnold's Langer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Was it your Camaron. sister? Yeah. Yeah. 
How are you? You're right. I'm okay. I'm glad you made a full recovery. A lot, a lot of time you never see who you never meet up with anyone after you've done it. So it's quite coming here today because yeah. I thought you're so good. Uh, all right. Say so thanks, thanks to you and the no, guys. No, no, no. The guys, the team. It's the whole team. It's all yeah, crew. It's, it's crew thing. Retirement from active service did not deter the future king from looking to the skies to fulfill his career ambitions and to continue the spirit of service to others. In 2014, it was announced that William would accept full-time employment as a pilot with the East Anglian Air Ambulance based at Cambridge Airport. Kate and William had another exciting announcement. They would be having their second child. In May 2015, Kate gave birth to Princess Charlotte who would be fourth in line to the succession of the throne. He made the decision, and it was a, quite a surprise when he announced he wanted to get back into the cockpit, because remember, he'd left the RAF. We all thought his um, flying days were behind him, and actually we'd see the Duke of Cambridge embark on a life of official public duty. Well, that hasn't happened. Um, he's gone back into the cockpit, albeit in a different capacity. He's flying now with the Air Ambulance Service. It's a charity, um, but it's still a full-time and demanding job. It also means he can have a career aside from the royal family, and it's an perfect arena of course because he's going out and helping to save lives um, so it ticks all of those boxes equally I think because he can base himself further up north and away from Kensington Palace which he considers a bit of a goldfish bowl he can enjoy this idyllic life helping to bring up the children at least in the next few years while they're still very young he took up his full-time role in July 2015 any salary paid to him would be donated to charity well first of all I'm just fantastically excited to be here today the first day it's been a long time coming it's been many exams and, and training to get here um, and I'm hugely excited to be joining a very uh, professional bunch of guys and girls um, doing a sort of unique complex job uh, with the air ambulance and it's it's sort of a follow-on from where I was with the military with search and rescue so many of the same sorts of skills and, and uh, in, in essence the similar type of job it just follows on from search and rescue to here so it was a natural natural progression but equally uh, doing a job like this is worthwhile valuable um, and to me there's an element of duty about it i'm really quite keen to to be involved with the guys and the girls doing um, a complex you know professional job how he's going to balance that with his numerous charitable commitments, all of his patronages, and of course his official duties, he's taken on investitures now, for example, all of these things to help assist the Queen and Prince Charles has yet to be seen. When I spoke to the palace about exactly how he'd manage everything, they seemed incredibly confident in William's ability as a multitasker and someone who will manage to allocate enough time for everything. For the next two years, this was Prince William's work on the front line as an emergency worker, sometimes witnessing intensive trauma and with a real hands-on approach to helping his medically qualified colleagues. There is little doubt that this would have had a significant impact on his mental health and personal life. I think nothing ever prepares you that well for what you're gonna see and some of the, some of the incidences. But uh, having done search and rescue before, we saw a lot of that already. And when you're working with a team, um, you, you, know, you help each other out and you talk about it and uh, you, you get through it that way. And so it's very important to talk about it. Well, there's nothing to say I couldn't do it for the rest of my life. I might be able to, I can still balance the two. But uh, obviously there's, at some point, there's probably gonna be a lot more pressure and responsibility. William said to a friend recently that, that his priorities were family and flying in that order. And uh, I think the emphasis on those two Fs Family and flying is exactly where it is for both of them. He's friendly, he's funny, um, he's you know, always sort of joking and bantering, particularly with, with other men and with colleagues. And I think that was how he managed to be accepted so readily um, by, by colleagues both in the armed forces and, and in the air ambulance. He just... And in, in all the charities that he works for as well, they really love him. Prince William's interest in air ambulance services remains to this day and, after supporting an anniversary for London's air ambulance charity in 2019, he became the official patron in March 2020. It was time to move closer to home and in July 2017, Prince William, Duke of Cambridge, left his position as an air ambulance pilot to take up full-time royal duties on behalf of the Queen. 
Prince William has made a fantastic contribution to the team. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have him on board. Um, he's a hard-working member of the team, always keen to get his hands dirty and help out, uh, whether it is just cleaning the aircraft or actually at scene, helping out with patients that are critically ill. He's a really valuable member of the team. I think the, 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 over, the, the, the big memory I'll have will be the, the day he arrived, really. Um, the very first day he arrived, you're supposed to call him for just 10 minutes, and he ended up staying for about four hours, um, <laughs> which is a good sign that he was comfortable amongst the team. Yeah. Um, and then his first day at work, really, um, we, we went to work long before we got a job and we were straight into a mission, a life-saving mission. He's been a fantastic member of the team, and that's really what we were looking for, was somebody who would really fit in, work hard, and really contribute to the operation of the East Anglian Air Ambulance, and he's done that in spades. He's been a terrific member of the team. He, he, made, a, he made a space for himself very quickly as a member of a highly professional team, and he earned the respect of everybody around him. He really will be missed because he's a terrific pilot. He's a great guy to have around. He's been really good at scene, and that's what that's the feedback I get from all of our clinical teams. And yeah, he's just been a great person to have as part of East Anglian Air Ambulance. Just under a year later, in April 2018, Kate gave birth to their third child, Prince Louis, who would be fifth in the line of succession. Prince William continues in his duties as a monarch in training at the same time as dedicating himself to the vital service of the Crown. He serves a vital role on numerous occasions supporting Her Majesty the Queen, but also focusing on areas of working life, which obviously mean a great deal to him. He is currently patron or president of many organisations, remaining particularly interested in conservation, young people, the armed forces, emergency responders and mental health. I think everything that William has done in his life has coloured what he, the charities that he's chosen to support. You know, the conservation comes from his time in Africa. His interest in the welfare of ex-military personnel comes from his time in, in the military. His experience as an air ambulance pilot, the people he saw there, the injuries, I think his interest in mental welfare is also tied up in all of that. He spent a lot of time in his youth in Africa, and I think it's certainly the role of his father, Prince Charles, in conservation has had a big impact upon him. It's something he's deeply, deeply passionate about. He's somebody, I think, that cares deeply about issues, but the homeless is one that he's actively involved with. He's also very keen in trying to help um, chill, young people that are on um, drugs and, have, and are trying to get through that problem um, and he does lend a lot of support to that and in fact in fact in my, it's my understanding he's not only doing stuff where he helps himself um, he actually does put his money where his mouth is and through his foundation he has contributed quite a lot of money to assisting people in this in this regard this family has service sort of you know, running through them. William has got it, his father's got it, his grandmother's got it. I think his role model is the Queen, not actually his parents. I think he felt that his parents blurred the distinction between the public and the private. The Queen has managed to keep her privacy and her personal life much more to herself. And I think William will try and do the same. The Duke has made many official visits around the UK, meeting a broad range of people who make a difference to their community. With Kate at his side, he has also carried out overseas tours on behalf of the Queen to the Commonwealth and beyond. William and Kate to me are about the future. I don't like to, to look back and compare her to Diana because she is her own woman and William and Kate I think have their own idea of what they want to do and I think you know you see the these two people moving forward and taking the monarchy forward. I say in my book that modernization is a very hard word to use in the context of the royal family because the royal family is built on history and tradition and protocol, but actually in William and Kate, you see a future king and queen who are driving it forward and taking it on to the next step. I think he will be very much a king who knows his own mind. William is a very determined man. 
I think he's mindful of history and won't do anything extraordinary, but I think he's also very much, much more a man of the, of the modern age and of the people than uh, any previous monarchs. The boy who would be king has become the man who would be king, and he's clearly demonstrated his ability to win hearts and minds wherever he goes, with a genuine warmth and care for the people he meets. Prince William has taken his role very seriously. Taking inspiration from his grandmother, the Queen, it's clear he does not take his royalty just as a privilege, but as a duty.